We are go for liftoff in T minus 30. Hit the record button. Italo, and this is Italo's Black Talk Radio. Uh, we have uh, another guest, a great guest today. Her name is Kara Lopez Lee. Good morning, Kara. Hey, how are you doing today? I am doing wonderful. How are you? I I happen to know you. Just had your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. Give me another minute. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have that. This, uh, my radio voice. Let's just say that it didn't ca- it didn't come through until five minutes ago, and I was like, <laughs> okay, now I now I can talk. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Kara is uh, a storyteller um, that I met. Uh, I think I met I met you at. Uh, busted, or was it before busted? I meant to. I no, it was, can at the, it was at the Lex. It was at the Lexington at TNT Storytelling. The there you go. Yeah. The right of the right or die. Uh, well, it was you were in a different one. I, I was in the right or die uh, featured uh, guest, but you were on the previous one, and I forget uh, which one it was. But it was. It it's wasn't called, about. It's called- it's called T and T storytelling, but that was the last show. They, um, I think, they stopped having storytelling shows at the Lexington in Los Angeles. Um, they yeah. just do. I think they just do comedy now. Yeah, so I think that was the last night that they uh, that they had that. Right, right. And so, yeah, I, I was fortunate to see you because I was like, "Well, this is the last show." Okay, um, and it was my first time being on the Lexington, so I was like, "Oh." Um, well, this was nice. <laughs> um, yeah, it was nice when yeah. to the one night you were there. <laughs> right. <laughs> it always happens to me. It's happened already a few times with me. And I'm like, this is the last day of this. this there was another open mic um, called Corazón del Pueblo, which was in, uh-huh. um, I, I want to say, East LA, I think it was. Um, and I showed up, and it, it was an amazing night, but it was the last night. And I was like, oh, wow, this is my first time coming here, but um, that was great. <laughs> um, and it was during the holidays, too, so it was like, oh. Uh, but anyhow, um, uh, yeah, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't matter the space. I think is the, the, the point is it doesn't matter the space. It matters the people. And so the yeah, artists, sure. you can always follow the artists, and we're always we're always going to be around, it doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter how. And uh, this yeah, is another platform. Yeah, we always find our way somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, that's what, that's kind of why I decided to do Black Tech Radio too, because we don't have much time on the, on the mic to and, or places to go, and we can be there on time, and the, the, we have to be traffic here in LA. So why not do it over yes. the phone? And so, and oh. uh, yeah, that's why I have I have you and I have so many amazing people showed up to my open uh, my open mic, my Black Talk Radio. Not only to share storytelling, but also poetry, uh, music. Um, I love the arts. So anything people want to share, it's amazing. And so there was a story that you shared. I don't know if that's the one that you're going to share today, but it was a, sh- a story that you shared at the Lexington that was so amazing. Um, I don't know if that's the one you're going to make do today, or was it the other one? Actually, that... I was hoping I was hoping to tell another one because uh, I'd like to do something different for you. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So <laughs> take it away, Kara. <laughs> oh, already? Okay. Okay. So. Um, so actually, this is a story I, I recently told at uh, at the moth, and the the theme was family. And I'll just tell you before I start that this was um, this is a story that I uh, the very first time I heard about storytelling, it was the one I wanted to tell, and I didn't really know that uh, live oral personal storytelling was a thing 
until about three years ago. Mm-hmm. I, I've done a lot of writing uh, through my life, but I didn't really know it was a thing. And when I heard, uh, the first I heard of it was the Moth Radio Hour. Um, and then I found out they had these these story slams where you could go put your name in a hat. And this was the story I wanted to tell. Um, but mm-hmm. I told a lot of other stories, and I only recently finally felt comfortable to tell this one uh, because it took me a long time to figure out how to tell a complicated family story in just a few minutes. So here, so here goes. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you about it. So, um, okay. yeah, so this is my most persistent childhood memory of my father. Him bellowing, let's go, Kara, and me running to keep up, and my dad never looking back to see if I'm still there. So uh, my dad only has one <laughs> other child. She's my half-sister. And uh, sometimes I worry he's going to leave her in the dust too. Uh, but there's not much I can do about it because I don't grow up with her because we're very far apart in age. So uh, in 2004, the year this story takes place, I'm 41 and she is only eight years old. So it's Christmas Day and my father's fifth wife, has just landed in rehab. Now, she's a very sweet woman, but she suffers from depression, and she kicked off this holiday season by nearly drinking herself to death. So now my dad wants to be the hero and give his wife a hallmark sort of a Christmas uh, by having a family caravan go visit her at her sober living home in the bells of L.A. Now, my dad is the kind of hero who needs followers, And I am the kind of daughter who craves approval, Uh, so I am flying all the way home from Denver to L.A. for this quest and on Christmas Day. Now, my dad lives very close Mm. to LAX, to the airport, and um, so we barely arrive at the house, and we're already in the garage with my dad giving us rapid-fire instructions. He's going to drive in the lead car with my grandpa, and he wants to lend me his other car so that I can follow with everyone else, uh, my husband, my grandma, and my eight-year-old sister. And so uh, one thing that you should know before we go on this little journey um, is that this is the early days of cell phones, so it's not that unusual that Dad and I are the only two people who have them. However, I have recently lost my cell phone at this point, so, and I admit this to my dad. And he says, well, that's okay. I've programmed your GPS. Besides, you'll be following me. And before I can say, yeah, but Dad, shouldn't you tell me where? He cuts me off and says, we're late. Let's go. And he tears out of the driveway, and my dad drives kind of like I remember him walking when I was a kid, you know, speeding and dodging in and out of people and never looking back to see if I'm there. But I know this, so I am on him turn for turn until um, about half an hour into this. We're somewhere in central L.A., and I'm waiting behind my father at a red light when, without warning, he switches into the left turn lane uh, just as the light turns green, and I get carried helplessly past him in the moving traffic. <laughs> and before I can make a U-turn to, to go back around and catch him, uh, the GPS announces, you have arrived at your destination. And everyone in our car looks around in confusion, like there's no rehab in sight, just a bunch of houses. And so I look back at the screen for the GPS, and the address has vanished. So, uh, and uh, there's no, my dad never wrote the address down, never told any of us the name of this place, and never taught me how to program this stupid GPS. And remember, nobody in our car has a cell phone. And if we found a pay phone, that would be no help at all because none of us can remember my dad's phone number. But if my father has taught me anything, it's survival. So I'm like, okay, we're just going to go back to where we lost him. Maybe he waited. Nope. So I'm like, okay. So I try the left turn that I apparently missed, and I stop at the first likely building, which is a nursing home. But they say the rehab is right next door. And I'm like, great, except my stepmom, not there. So they suggest maybe I should try the rehab down the street. So apparently there's like a rehab on every square block of central L.A., and my stepmom is in none of them. So my sister is panicked in the back seat. She's like, what if we don't make it in time to see my mom? Because, you know, they have limited visiting hours. And it hits me at that moment. You know, this time 
I'm not the only person who's going to suffer for my failure to keep up with my dad, and I want to cry. But instead, I just yell at this driver who's not letting me merge. Stop denying reality. I'm here. And my sister says, are you talking to me? And I say, no, sweetie, of course not. Um, But finally, after like 45 minutes of circling this one area of town, my grandma says, you know, I think your father mentioned a friendly something. Oh, I find the last surviving payphone in Los Angeles, and I uh, track down a friendly house. And they put my dad on, and immediately he wants to know, well, why didn't you just follow the GPS? I say, oh, my God, Dad, could you please just tell me how to get there? So he does. Mm -hmm. And back in the car, we're explaining to my little sister that these are the moments in life that are funny at the time or that are upsetting at the time you know, that are painful, but that they later become funny memories that families laugh about together. And she's a little mystified by this. Um, But but then a few minutes later, we do get uh, to the house. It's this old Victorian house with a teeny tiny sign, like the smallest sign in the world that says friendly house. And my dad explains Mm. why he ditched us back there. He says he saw gas selling for several cents cheaper than anywhere else in L.A. So, you know, he had to stop Mm. for that. Okay, so a really awkward visit with my stepmom follows. Um, And afterward, my dad says that uh, he's going to stay behind to have Christmas dinner with his wife, you know, just the two of them, which, you know, it's that kind of devotion is probably why they're still friends to this day, um, even though they have since divorced. But for me, it means that it's now all on me to drive everyone else back in one car back to my dad's house and serve them Christmas dinner. And the silence on the drive back in the car is unbearable until my sister pipes up from the back seat and says, hey, Kara. I say, yeah. She says, remember that Christmas we got lost in L.A.? Everybody busts out laughing. And, you know, I catch her eye in the rearview mirror, and I can tell by her expression that she knows it's too soon for this joke. Uh, But I love her for it because, you see, I get it now. It's like no matter whether she or I ever catches up with dad, it doesn't matter because we both have something now that I didn't have when I was growing up, a sister. Mm. And that's my story. Wow. Great. Good story. Um, And I love, love, oh, yeah, I I heard it already, but each time I hear it, I get something else. Um, well, well you, uh, hopefully you did because, yeah, hopefully you did get something else Why? because I changed it since the last time that I told <laughs> you. Him. Did you did? Yes. Um, yeah, it was a little, it was a little longer, I think. Um, but no, it's I, I like it because it's uh, it's it's so rich in in description and and describing the whole, you know, everything. The, the Victorian house is the you know the. Uh, it, the, the whole thing, I just, I can just picture it. I don't even know where this is, but I, I know it's in LA, but I just can't picture, you know, where, I don't know. It's just in my mind, it does, it does come, these pictures come to me when you're talking. So it's, it's really oh, great I'm so to, glad to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, I can just see it. And I can see the back seat. That's where your sister is. Um, I don't know. I just, I just picture things when you're talking, when you're saying this story. But uh, you, you actually had been working on this story a few times. So what makes what makes this story, I mean, I know it's a great story, but it's, okay. yeah, I just like how you, how you, how you crafted it in, into what it is today. Um, do you do this at the mosque also? You already did it or? Yeah, I did. I did. I told it um, uh, about a week ago, I guess. Not even, maybe not even a week ago. Well, no, actually a week ago, last last Wednesday. Yeah, and um, it was really well received. And you know, it's funny because about a week before that, I I um, I had tried it at another. You know what? You know, actually, it was the time you heard it. We were in a workshop together, weren't we? You were you were more auditing it. You were yeah. just listening to the workshop. But I was <laughs> yeah, workshopping was. this story. Yeah, I was workshopping this story, and um, it used to be a lot longer, and it kind of fell a little flat. Mm. Um, 
And, and then I tried it again and I shortened it and I lengthened it and I shortened it. My, my stories, and actually when I write books, it's always like an accordion. It, uh, it expands and contracts and expands and contracts, and you're trying to find the story in the story. Um, and so what, what I think happened was is that um, with family, it's always complicated, right? I mean, this is one moment in a very complicated family life, as you can tell by the little teeny elements that come in. And so it's very hard to let go of all you know in favor of what are the pieces that are important for the audience to understand so that they get it. Um, and, right. and the difference between those two, it's like, you know, and you know what I love is sometimes people give me advice and they're like, well, you know, to, to tell, tell a story, you just only need to like tell the details that are important for the audience to know. And I'm like, oh, well, that's easy. I'll just do that. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's not easy. <laughs> right. It's very difficult. No. Um, so, you know, what are the parts that the audience needs? So you're constantly experimenting. And one of the things that I like about it, it's kind of a double-edged sword with, with, with oral storytelling versus, like, if I write a book or an essay, is that, you know, to me, the performance of the, of the book or the essay, the memoir, the novel, you know, the poem, whatever it is, uh, once it's published, it's sort of this static mm. thing. Um, and people read it, and that's what it is. And even if you, like I've read I, my memoir, you know, um, uh, since you know since it originally came out, and I thought, man, this would be a totally different book now because there's so many things that I would do, yeah. but it's done. Right. Okay, but with a, with an oral mm. story, you can tell it one night, and then even if it goes well or if it doesn't go well, it doesn't matter. However it goes, you can, uh, you know, a week later, a month later, a year later, ten years later, you can tell it again, and it can be something completely different, and you can improve it, and you can push and pull and move the words around and the ideas and decide something is more important than you ever thought or decide, well, the story's really here or this is the more important character or I can, you know, dump these pieces out because they're not important. It just has this whole different life. Um, and mm-hmm. I like that because it's, like it's like a living thing. So what happened basically was just that, I mean, I'm telling you what happens with all my stories, but with this one was mm-hmm. there's, there's a lot of family, dra- years of family drama um, mm-hmm. that, that, that goes into this. And I, I think I wanted to explain too much of it when I first ever told it. And then even later, mm-hmm. it was hard because there's so many people in these two cars. I mean, there are actually six mm-hmm. people in the story. And, and I don't like to tell oral stories with more than two people, really. Um, but if there are mm-hmm. three people, it's like, okay, but that's kind of pushing your luck. Because you're talking to an audience and you're trying to get them to picture something very quickly. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's easy to picture two people kind of okay to picture three but once it gets past that you're trying to picture where everyone is in the space and in time and and it's it can become difficult but what I was able to do was every time I did the story so I would ask people for a note you know can you tell me like or or maybe they might just volunteer it because you know in the storytelling community sometimes that happens you know like like, because we've gotten to know each other um, and so I have right. friends in the story community, and I also keep workshopping this thing. And somebody mm-hmm. will always give me a note, you know, and they'll say, well, here's what works best for me, or here's what I get out of it. Um, and mm-hmm. when I know what's working for them, I know which parts become more important and which parts to tease out. And when they tell me which parts are like, God, I wanted to know more about this, or I have a question. Like, it doesn't have to be, a, you know, a criticism. It's just like, wow, I had a question about this. I'm like, oh, well, I'd rather that they didn't have any questions when it was over. I'd rather I'd answered them. So, I, so I'll try to answer that. And so what happened ultimately about a, a week before I told the story at the moth, I decided, nope, the story's too complicated to ever tell at the moth. It's too, it'll take too long, and we get five minutes at the moth. You know, mm-hmm. So I'm never telling it at the moth. I decided that, never telling it at the moth. I'll just tell it elsewhere. <laughs> and then mm-hmm. and then I did one more workshop after the one you and I uh, were in. And mm-hmm. somebody said, oh, you're giving, you gave your sister um, like a life skill, a coping skill mm-hmm. with the thing about yeah. um, 
these are the moments in life that are painful at the time, but they become funny memories that you laugh about later. And it's, that's always been in the story because that's always the reason I wanted to tell it was because she said that mm-hmm. and she was only eight and I couldn't believe she said that. I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. Um, but, but what she's saying is, oh, because you guys told her that, it gave her this, this coping skill, and that's what unlocked it because I realized that I had always been afraid that she would suffer some of the, you know, the difficulties of communicating with my dad or, or connecting with my dad that mm-hmm. I had. And then the realization mm-hmm. is that, yeah, but lucky her, she has a sister. I didn't have <clears throat> one. And and then the the, the, the the final sort of piece is, oh, and lucky me, because I have a sister and I never had one before. Like it's not just lucky her because she has me to give her this coping skill, but it's lucky me because I was really – feeling tense in that car and this little eight-year-old kid gave me something and mm-hmm. that's what unlocked the story so the ending changed um mm. the way i perceived it it was really all about it's really all about having something we hadn't had before which was a sister and then that unlocked the story mm. so that's yeah so uh, i you know maybe that's a long way to get to answering your question but that's how i <laughs> no, that's okay. how i write yeah which I, I, I find it uh, so much interesting to do with storytelling because I, I used to do um, poetry. Um, well, I still do. But uh, in doing storytelling, uh, and I've been doing this just recently, is um, not only you're not attached to your paper, because I used to be attached to, your, to my paper and uh, following the, the, you know, the lines and everything and not connected to the audience. And so when I finally decided to to drop the my security blanket down because that's basically what it was. You know, it was my security blanket. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And then you just, you know, that's that that was just another way of connecting to people. And then when you connect to people, it's they you get so much more. I get so much more. <clears throat> you know, and then you see what is working uh almost 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 immediately and what is not working. Um, hopefully, you know, what is working. Um, so I don't know. It's just giving me so much more. It's another skill, basically, because reading yeah. something is so so different than, than just sharing a story. And uh, sharing a story is so hard because you have to remember where where this is going. And not only that, but just keep it. It is so it's very hard. <laughs> Just keeping it time wise. Yeah. I am not really good with time. Yeah. Yeah. It's a skill Sorry, it's go an ahead. art, you know, I think. No, I was just gonna say it's a, it's a, it's its own art form. Um but it, it you know, it's made all my other writing uh you know, that I do so much better because it requires um you to sort of dump all the extraneous things that aren't absolutely necessary to push the story forward you really have to push a lot overboard and I when I write for um, you know for the eye when I write uh, things to be published or for the you know the written word um, I tend to overwrite I tend to have like way too much information in there and um, this oral storytelling has forced me to really uh, you know brevity is the soul of it and so to shorten everything um and right. it has actually made it's made it a lot easier for me to keep things tight when i'm writing for any other form um so it's been really instructive right well i mean you have a like you have a background of in journalism journalism i do so i, I yeah. know yeah yeah so i, I can tell why you want to give so much information um in the piece uh, but it's, it's it's not the same as journalism. It's it's basically storytelling. So storytelling has exactly. to be uh, more engaging and more to the point. And yeah, it's it's different. Um, but yeah, uh, that's why I I I really liked you there. And I was like, oh, this is that was a great story. And we just connected after that. And uh, and I did actually say something <laughs> in a different podcast about the workshop. So let me just clarify something, because when I was in the workshop and you were in the workshop, I felt I did not feel comfortable, and maybe it's because I didn't know 
everybody else. So I just wanted to be the observant and I didn't want to say much because I really don't like to be criticized or to be critiqued, you know. And it's I took rough, it right? before I used yeah. to take it personal before. <clears throat> And you, you guys were just very comfortable doing it. So I was like, um, I don't want to share anything today. <laughs> but it's, it's um, yeah, I, I didn't want to say that on, on before on the podcast, but I just felt like that I, I, because it was a time that I went to this um, um, writing group, right? And uh, yeah. it was a writing group, and we were we all knew each other. It was I think uh, five of us. And we were very comfortable with each other because we had already been workshopping for, I don't know, a couple months. Yeah. Um, anyways, and then somebody brings this guest over. And we were all a little concerned about that. And we were like, well, we're just, you know, sharing our stories that we just wrote, uh, you know, literally, we just wrote it. And so it's very, we're very sensitive to that, to that you know, to having somebody else. And so we, anyways, we did share it, and immediately he was already um, criticizing it, not even critiquing it. We were told how to do it, and this is how you do the poetry, oh and this is how you rhyme, and we were all like, "Oh, oh no, you did not do that." So, and I, wow. I was so angry, I was very upset. And um, anyhow, um, I even wrote yeah, a piece well, uh, called, would... the... "Oh yeah, yeah, you would have been." Uh, I wrote a piece called El Conquistador because he was the conqueror that came to conquer us. Yeah, yeah. And it just became this <laughs> battle between. Oh, you wrote me. you wrote a piece called El Conquistador about him. Yeah. El, Con- he was El there Conquistador is about him. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Oh my I just goodness. just picture him like coming, coming to you know, coming to uh, the the land, uh, you know, the free here, and then having his way with us and bringing his Bible and bringing his religion and his uh, idea, 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 idiocracy? No, I don't say it right. Anyways, his beliefs. Idiocracy? Bringing his beliefs idiocracy? over. Idiocracy? right. <laughs> yeah. And we're all like, excuse <laughs> you, who do you think again. you are? And so, <laughs> and so but yeah, uh, ever since, since then, actually, I learned how to take criticism better, of course. I just did. Um, anyways, yesterday I just had this conversation with my my director friend, and we're working on um, the mother trials. And so there was something that he told me that I was like, hmm, okay. I just have this idea of how, yeah, how it's gonna go forward because uh, I kind of have to make reality or real events. Uh, and fictionalize yeah. them in order to for for me to help the story right. carry the story right. along, and that right. to me was a revelation yesterday. I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, I learn I learn something every day, right? Right, right. Well, I um I actually write in um in multiple forms myself. So I, I write fiction and nonfiction. And at the time that I started doing this uh, storytelling, um, you know, I've been, I've been working on a, a novel. Uh, mm. And so, um, yeah. So and the novel is inspired by family stories that my uh, grandmother told me ancestral stories, you know, stories about her and her, parents and uh, all these people from the past and um, I I um, I like all the forms I think they all have some sort of truth to impart I don't I I'm starting to really learn that uh, each is just sort of a, a different expression of the truth you know the poetry the there's also I've done slash mm-hmm. fiction, which is just very short fiction, but it's it's actually more than just very short fiction. It's very short fiction, but it uh, there's a lot of uh, crossover in the field between flash fiction and and poetry, um, and then these these uh, essays and micro essays and memoir and novel and short story, and then now this oral storytelling. Um, I really love all of it. Um, now you're a, you're a poet, mm-hmm. so I want to ask you: when you came at mm-hmm. the, um, the the storytelling, 
do you find mm-hmm. any um, any correlation or any like points of similarity or intersection between how you treat poetry and how you treat mm-hmm. storytelling? Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, I do. Um, I yeah, I find I find that poetry. In, well, there was a time that I found poetry in everything. <laughs> Uh, it was when sure. I was high well, in a uh, concert, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, <That's> hilarious. <laughs> and I wasn't smoking. <laughs> Trust me. It was, it was just the contact high from other people that were high around me. I got me. you. Uh, I get it. Hollywood okay. Bowl. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, <laughs> anyhow, <laughs> but yeah, there's, 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 uh, I think there's, there's poetry because my, my kind of poetry is not, doesn't rhyme. It's uh, it's kind of like a spoken word kind of, uh, you know. I don't, I don't, I don't really rhyme much, um, and I do sometimes, but I have to, you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, I, I found poetry yeah, in, in every in every story has, like for instance, earlier you were, so you were telling your story earlier, and I, what what stood out to me, is how you were keeping up with your dad. That stood out to me a lot, and you said it a few times keeping up with dad or you know dad mm-hmm. is so far away we have to keep up with him that was very poetic yeah um oh yeah yeah i can see yeah. your point mm-hmm. yeah good to i have a image. story yeah. too so i have this story where, where i was actually <laughs> running <clears throat> running after my dad because my dad was used to be a marathon runner and he would be you know oh um, wow he would be so literally yeah he would be <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah and he would be like keep up with me and he would be like I don't know, like a mile away, and I'm like, oh, I'm like trying to catch, trying to, trying to catch my breath. So I, I yeah, related yeah. with your story in a different way, but uh, yes. yeah, poetry has a way of connecting, you know, emotionally with the audience, and that's, that's uh, uh, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm loving uh, the storytelling thing. I'm like, I'm loving this because it's, it's you would think, um, you would think it's there's not. Um, you would think there's not a structure, but trust me, there's a, so much structure oh, going on. Oh, it's very yes. It's almost like um like a structure that there is with a um with like a sonnet. You know, like there are certain beats that you have to hit, uh, and there's a, a certain amount of time. I mean, you don't have to be exact, but there's really only a certain amount of time if you're gonna depending on the length of the story, um, that you mm-hmm. have to to set up sort of the history that 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 uh builds into the moment and then you you know you have this moment that you stretch into a scene and you only have and then you have the you know the height of the conflict and then something turns and then you have this resolution you know and something has to change and uh, you, so there's all these things that have to happen in a certain time period it's um god i'm stressing myself out just talking about it but it's fun it's a lot of fun i mean it's um it's it when and then when you're on the stage and you're trying to balance that it's a, like a i liken it to you know the old cliche of you know a tight wire act or a high wire act you know tight rope you know right. you're just walking on this thing you know and you're hoping that it all stays you know together because the other thing is, is you're trying to sound spontaneous even though you've you know practiced this thing a lot and you definitely don't mm-hmm. want to like memorize things word for word because if you do that it's like you're acting and you're not really telling a story i mean it's quite complex um it and is. it's funny because the, the people who do it the best doesn't sound complex at all you know there's there there are some mm-hmm. people actually some of my favorite storytellers are the ones who get up there and it almost sounds like they're not doing anything you know, they just mm. they just talk, and you just all of a sudden you find you're leaning forward, and you can't stop listening or paying attention, and you're just riveted, and you don't know how that how or when that happened. It's like it sneaks up on you. That's my favorite is when somebody yeah. can do that. Yeah, that well, right, that, isn't right. that our favorite kind of story? Isn't that our favorite kind of storytelling in general, though, in a book or in a in a poem? when you don't even realize mm. what's happening, when you are just so in the middle of whatever of uh, the, mm-hmm. the artist has presented to you, uh, shoot, that even happens right. in the painting, right? You're so you're so in it that you forget that you're there. You forget your own. You just become mm-hmm. one with whatever's happening, and you don't mm-hmm. even notice that something is being done 
for you or with you or to you. You're just there with it. And I, I, that is like, that is the moment when you can experience that or when you can create that experience for someone else. That's what makes stories so wonderful to me. I mean, I've been in love with stories mm-hmm. since I was a little kid. I used to, when I was little, my father, I was, you know, one of those lonely, only children. Remember, my sister didn't come till I was a grown up. And so mm-hmm. I, uh, my, my dad used to walk by me when I, I would sit in this big chair and just close my eyes. And I wasn't sleeping. I was telling myself stories when I was really small. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, and my dad, I said to dad, he said he used to see me sitting in that chair. And I said, you know, I was just telling myself a story. He said, oh, yeah, I knew that. He knew <laughs> that's what I was doing. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Did he know that? I don't think he knew that. You Maybe don't think so? You think he's making know. that up? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> it's possible. It's, oh yeah, sure. Con- sure, I know you were. Yeah, just- <laughs> right. Oh yeah, I knew that. Yeah, maybe he's maybe he's just got me fooled. I mean, my dad's my dad could be. He's still maybe ahead of me. Like he's got me fooled. Yeah, you know, and I love that idea about you know our our parents like getting ahead of us. I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Because when we tell a story about our families, you know, there can be a lot of dysfunction or function or any, everything mm. in between. Um, and you're trying to encapsulate all these uh, events of your life into like one idea, right? You know, to explain mm-hmm. it. Right. Actually, you have me thinking of something else too. Uh, how many, how many um, people in our lives or family members or, yeah, mostly family members, I think, or people that you grew up with are storytellers. Like my, <clears throat> my tia Elva, she was such a great storyteller. Even to this day, I would remember a story that she would tell me when I was a child, you know, like, oh, yeah, she yeah. told me about how she saw, she went to see Alien, the movie Alien, and she told me the story of Alien, and I was so fascinated by the way she told the story that when I went to see the movie, I, was, I wasn't that impressed because I thought <laughs> her story, the way, as- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I already knew the whole thing, but I'm like, well, she the way she told it, oh, though, my- <laughs> you know, it's like. Wow, that's um, amazing. Yeah, yeah, and then my dad has <laughs> has stories. Uh, well, of course, he he was a great. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, he was a great storyteller, <clears throat> and he would tell me all about the USA because I, we we grew up in Peru. So everything that um, he told me about the USA was so amazing and was so fantastic. And when I got here, I was disappointed. I was like. Hmm. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get it. It's so like, embellished. It's like when talk, yes, when somebody tells me they want me to see like a movie, um, I always, as soon as they have sold me on seeing it, I tell them to stop because because I know that's going to happen. You know, yeah. uh, if they tell me too much, I'm just it's going to lose. It's just like puncturing the balloon; all the air is going to go out. You know, it's just yeah, um, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so don't, don't believe the hype, <laughs> basically, <laughs> of a storyteller. <laughs> no, but um, <laughs> uh, no, but we actually, I think it is. That's the point of this, right? Is we have to embellish the story to make it more, more fun for the audience or more entertaining. Um, and there's always a message. There has to be a message, otherwise, a story doesn't really um, have a point unless you have a message in there. So. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I well, think you know, uh, the, the, the embellishment to me, though, is more about it's not about like, I mean, just to be clear about saying things that didn't happen, but it's more like which things are you going to emphasize mm-hmm. and which things are mm-hmm. you going to de-emphasize and when are you going to use hyperbole, you know, to sell mm-hmm. your point, yeah. you know, and yeah. And um, and, you know, it's like it's like uh, who was it? I'm not going to remember who said this. Oh, oh, I think it was Alfred Hitchcock, who who had said that you know mm. that drama was just. I'm I'm going to like mess this up, but it's something like you know drama is just life with the boring parts taken out. You know, <laughs> so right. I mean, yeah. you know, so you just like remove all the yeah all the, and, and again that's the challenge. But yeah, and then the, the the message to me it's more like well what does it mean. Um, what does it all mean? And, mm-hmm. you know, how have you been changed? But I got to tell you, like, the how you've been changed by a story is always an interesting, you know, by what happens in the story. How has the 
main character been changed, it's always been interesting to me about how directly we need to state it. Um, and in, I, I have a real challenge with this, and I'm still working on it, about like when you're, when you're telling a story to people, how directly or indirectly you state the change that has taken place. Because sometimes the change could be, for example, acceptance of what is. So it can seem like nothing has changed. You know, yet everything has changed because you've accepted a truth. You know what I mean? So, mm, okay. like you've accepted the, the maybe, yeah, yeah. So, um, I'm really, I'm really wrestling with that right now. That's my sort of my latest thing because I definitely do think it's important to the reader or listener or viewer or audience. You know, whether it's a movie or a, a play, a book, a, you know, a story on stage, uh, whatever it is. <laughs> that the audience wants to feel like something has changed by the end of the story. Right. Um, but, um, but it's not, you know, yeah, I just, I just don't know how much. Ooh. Oh, hello. I think we lost her. Oh, Kara Lopez. No. I think she, she was going, going, and she's gone, guys. <laughs> and I was like, I, I closed my eyes for a minute. I was like, is she, what? Oh, she dropped out. Um, anyways, I do want to thank Kara Lopez. Uh, she's a great storyteller, and I <clears throat> I don't know if she's going to be calling back. But uh, if she can hear this later, uh, I want to thank her for calling in. Uh, she's She can be seen. <clears throat> Well, if you want to follow her on Facebook or I don't know if she has any Instagram accounts, I'll put everything below on the podcast. Uh, I do, uh, again, I am really thankful that you called. She's a very, very, uh, very solid storyteller. And I do want to follow her wherever she goes. So um, I'll keep you updated or I'll put her information below um, if you want to. Oh, here she comes. Uh, let me put her in. Wait. I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. We're still off to the end here. I just wanted to let you know that uh, we actually have a minute left. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I was like, I had my, had my eyes closed, and you. I was like, oh, that was very quiet. Oh my God, I lost you. Um, <laughs> but I know I do want to thank you for calling in. Um, again, this is a great, a great show, and I want to have more storytellers come in. So I already had Katya before, uh, Scott before, and now I have you, and and we have so many more storytellers in, in LA, um, in the community. So I'm gonna bring them in one by one. But uh. So, okay. So that um that what just happened um what. What do we do? Nothing? Oh no. You mean for the podcast? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's almost it's almost over. We have a minute left. But I do uh, uh I will actually have a part two. Uh we should have a part two. Uh yeah. Because it's about to be cut off. But I mean, I no, we're still on the air actually. That's what I was Oh, are we? Oh, okay. Okay. I'm yeah. Sorry. I I put you in right away, I put you in conference. Oh, uh, oh I see. Okay. Well, I hope yeah. I didn't say anything untoward. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, no, you're... it's just a very odd moment. I'm sorry I got cut off there. Anyway, um, yeah. okay. Well, it was, it's, Victory, it's so wonderful to talk with you about stories. I just, it's my favorite thing to talk about. So, um, and uh, I could tell we could talk all day. So. Right. We're storytellers, so we could talk all day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, once again, thank you, and we're going to say bye-bye for now. Goodbye, adios, and then we'll talk soon. Happy holidays. Okay. (laughs) You have a great day, Sarah. We are go for liftoff in T-30. Hit the record button.
didn't see that coming. 